Olá a todos. Um, my name is Nicola. I work for Siena, and with me is Anna, my colleague, uh, and we're both on the fisheries team at the Siena NGO. Siena is a Portuguese NGO that focuses on marine conservation. And we've been developing these webinars as a way of uh, promoting some uh, promoting some uh, concept and, and discussions on several topics in marine biology during this uh, during these confinement times uh, to allow for people to to engage in discussion and, and gain some knowledge in different aspects. And today we are uh, honored to have Dr. Uh, Daniel Pauli with us uh, to share a presentation. Uh, welcome, Dr. Daniel Pauli. Hello, Hello, Professor. Hello. Uh, thanks for joining us and welcome. Um, so, a quick word on the on the webinar. Um, it's it's going to be quite straightforward. So, we're going to have a presentation by by Professor uh, Daniel Pauli, and then that will be followed by a Q and A um, session, where you'll be uh, invited to ask questions or give comments. Uh, we ask that you do this in the Q and A box, which you will find on the bottom of your screen and not in the chat box, please, because that's going to facilitate our job um, asking the questions to, to the professor. So please, if you have any questions or comments, even during uh, the Dr. Daniel's presentation, please uh, insert them in the Q&A box. Uh, a quick word on, uh, about our NGO. Uh, CN is a Portuguese NGO uh, that focuses in marine conservation, uh, namely in sustainable fisheries, aquaculture, uh, marine protected areas and marine litter so far. We are engaging in other topics as well, but those are our main issues. And obviously, we work a lot in, in, um, in environmental awareness and, and uh, spreading the word about some of the issues that our oceans face. So this uh, series of webinars are a nice way for us to do that, that aspect of our job as well. Uh, we, with us today, we are honored and, and very happy to, to host Dr. Daniel Pauli. Uh, personally, I've been lucky enough to attend one of his talks when he came to Southern Portugal in the University of Algarve quite a few years ago. And obviously, me and Anna are quite happy to be, to, to be hosting and interviewing Dr. Daniel Pauli today. Uh, as most of you or all of you will know, uh, Dr. Daniel Pauli is a reference in fisheries biology. He is the principal um, investigator at the Sea Around Us initiative at the University of British Columbia. Uh, for those of you who haven't visited the website, I invite you to do so. It's a very interesting website with tons of uh, important information and is uh, very much uh, a reference in this domain and the, and the recipient of several uh, honors and, and awards for his scientific work. Uh, aside from more than 500, um, 500 research articles that he, that he has written over, over his scientific career, he is of course known for one of one of the most important uh, papers in this domain, which is the fishing down the marine food web, which has been a huge step uh, in in getting people to talk about overfishing and the consequences that overfishing might have. So uh, again, we're just thrilled to to have you, uh, Professor Pauli. Uh, bienvenue. Uh, and I'll, I'll just give you the floor. Again, I ask everyone, uh, please feel free to drop any questions or questions you might have in the Q&A box. So me and Anna can, can do, can do uh, those after the, the professor's presentation. Uh, I'll just remind everyone that this session is being recorded, so you'll be available, so you'll be, uh, you'll be, it'll be available online afterwards. Uh, for you to share with any colleagues or friends you might have that, that have interest and maybe cannot attend today. Anna, let me know if I'm forgetting anything, but otherwise... No, I think you got it, yes. Uh, welcome everybody, welcome Dr. Paul, we are very honored to have you here and let's jump into the presentation, perfect. Let's, uh, Professor Paul, you have the floor. Thank you for, for joining us. Thank you. All right, I will talk about uh, you can see my screen, I hope. Yes. Uh, yes. I will talk about the major trend in marine fisheries. And um, with, uh, with that, we, I must present our species. Uh, it all, all started in, in Africa millions of years ago, and we were part of the ecosystem and um, uh, prey of large predators. And um, we involved we evolved two, two tricks. One of them is, uh, is language. And uh, language, we became 
and symbolic thinking, and we ceased to be prey and we became efficient predators. And um, the first evidence of, uh, of seafood use was 165,000 years ago in South Africa. Obviously, we have used uh, the, the, the sea uh, earlier, but uh, th there we have a, a first uh, use uh, documented in, uh, in archaeological uh, uh, residues, including um, the, the shell of abalone that were used for pigments. Uh, pigments were used for painting uh, the face, uh, for example, and that is uh, an indication of symbolic thinking. Uh, we began very early also to develop uh, fearsome weapons and tools uh, for hunting, and uh, the first evidence of harpoons uh, were uh, stemmed from the, the Congo uh, uh, about 90,000 years ago. Now, as you know, about 70,000 years ago, people left Africa, modern humans left Africa and, and, and entered the different continents. Uh, they met in Europe, they met Neanderthals. Uh, in, uh, in Asia, they met probably uh, cousins of Neanderthal called Denisovans. And in other continents, uh, except America, they, uh, in Asia, uh, uh, essentially, they met Homo erectus, who had left earlier about uh, one million, two million years ago. But uh, these uh, different uh, people were wiped out along with all the large animals that most of the large animals that this that occurred there and uh, i will take the example of australia it had a, a, a huge fauna of um, of um, marsupial mammals uh, that ranged from uh, the equivalent of rhinoceros and and to the equivalent of, of bears and, and lions and they were all wiped out 50,000 years ago, 40, 50,000 years ago, because humans uh, can do it. And because humans don't like uh, competition. Uh, uh, and uh, this was, uh, they were annihilated very early. And uh, I make a big jump. We, we, the industrialization of the world began in, um, in, uh, 1700 uh, in 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 um, in the UK with uh, first pumps in in mining and stuff, but really it is the 19th century that uh, that industrialization began, and uh, you can see the uh, expansion of steel production. Uh, now uh, the country that produces most steel is in China on the other side of the world. Now what can you do with steel? We can do steels. You can do steel boats. And steel boats are different from everything that we had before. Because with steel boats, if they are big enough, you can fish anywhere. You can fish when you want. You can fish any depth you want. And uh, you, you can compete against sailboats and rowboats in a way that was never seen. And these first steel boats that were steel trawlers that were developed in uh, 1800, uh, they began to be operating around Britain, had enormous catches to start with. Uh, uh, but uh, immediately, uh, within 10, 10, 15 years, they had to leave the coastal areas where they operated to go, to go further offshore in the open North Sea because because they had wiped out the stocks that uh, they relied on. And this pattern of exploiting and having to move on is, uh, will, be, will be a theme that uh, I will talk about uh, uh, in the next minute. So basically, we, uh, we moved away from fishing with artisanal uh, or, or, or sailboats to industrialized operation. And this industrialized operation were very much patterned or very much modified or adapted from 
warships. And uh, you can see that in the technology. The steam trawlers obviously were uh, a fishing version of steel uh, warships. And uh, the transition to uh, diesel engine uh, also was uh, came from warships. And you can see, uh, especially after World War II, the, the range of, uh, of uh, gear that was used to, to find uh, uh, fish was adapted from the, 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 from the technology that we developed to, uh, to find submarines, the radar, acoustic fish finders, sonars, spotter plane, and later satellite navigation is all was all developed for the military. And uh, so this we, we clearly won the war on fish uh, because uh, fish uh, are less smart than the captains of submarines. Now, this, uh, this growth of industrial fishing uh, can be represented um, uh, in, by uh, taking the cumulative power of the engines of the fleets of the world. And this is, uh, this is uh, nearly 10 years, 10 years old, this, this image, but it, it has not changed. The trend has not changed. The, the, there is this enormous buildup of, of energy um, hungry uh, vessels, especially in Asia and uh, in Europe as well. Uh, every, every campaign in Europe to reduce fishing uh, 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 end up with uh, old boat being retired or more powerful boats being, uh, being um, launched. Uh, compared with uh, the fleets of Europe and uh, especially Asia, those in South America and uh, North America uh, are not very important. Now, uh, this pattern of expansion and uh, you can illustrate it uh, on our website. We have um, data, uh, geo-reference data catches uh, that go from 1950 to the 2014. Now we are updating them to 18. So here is, for example, where uh, Spain uh, fished in, uh, in the 50s, in 1950, about. Spain was operating uh, in, in Canada, obviously, and along the African coast and around Spain. Now, that's where Spain operates now. And, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, for other countries, uh, China, France, and Korea, and, and Taiwan, and so on. Uh, this is not very nice uh, because the catch per tonne per kilometer uh, squared is not a good measure. Um, but uh, you will see in a second another approach. Here uh, is a demonstration, the first that we did with a Portuguese uh, student of ours at the time, uh, Telmo Morato. Uh, and this is a demonstration that we fish deeper and deeper uh, based on, on data that we had at the time in the Sea Rounders uh, database. Uh, actually, the, the trend of fishing is uh, deeper and deeper, is actually more rapid and, uh, and um, more rapid than, than shown here. We can show that now. So we, before, we, before we launched in, uh, in further discussion, we have to exp I have to explain uh, uh, some work that we did with, uh, over the last uh, 15 years which is uh, that the catch reconstruction. Because if you want to work on international fisheries, which is what we do, you, you operate differently than if you work on a local fishery. If you work, say, on a, a fisheries in southern Portugal in a port that you know the captains and so you know what everybody does, you, 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 have, you can collect good data. But if you want to work, uh, if you want to compare the fisheries of Portugal with those of, of Taiwan and Hong Kong and, and, and uh, South Korea, you are obliged to, to take data that you don't really know well and uh, that will originate from FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Now, these data are 
communicated by the countries and the countries uh, don't 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 communicate uh, the all the detail of all the fisheries that they have and so we 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 start uh, we we reconstruct the fishery by first using like you do a puzzle, puzzle first using the reported data that because uh, they they provide a, a framework and then we add everything that we can from other sources uh, uh, that are unreported uh, fisheries that are unreported but documented in various sources and uh, this is very tedious work but uh, it is documented uh, in uh, in our website that you can visit and I have taken here uh, the example of uh, of uh, of uh, Portugal you can see the black line the, the black line is what Portugal reports to FAO as uh, having caught and uh, this is uh, the catch above the black line is is essentially what 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 was not reported and that that can be uh, 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 discard that is not reported and that is uh, fisheries that are that end up not being reported and and uh, um, I, I don't know I don't remember specifically what uh, was the non-reporting uh, it was <clears throat> this uh, the work here was done with Portuguese colleague notably uh, Kerry Mazzini and others we have done that also for the Azores or Madeira and and all countries uh, of the world and territories. The result uh, of this, and you can visit that on our website. Uh, you can get uh, this this catch by by uh, species. You can get the catch by uh, by gear. You can get the catch by country fishing and so on. This is uh, very detailed. Uh, and the 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 sum total of all of this was was published uh, in uh, 2016 and basically we found that uh, the catch of the world is bigger and declining and bigger it is because uh, all countries uh, tend to under report their catch except for a few countries in Asia that over report their catch. Uh, 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 China was a case in point or uh, there are other countries like Myanmar and uh, uh, that over report they catch also Vietnam uh, for certain political reason uh, but uh, the fact is that most country under report they catch and and that is particularly the case in uh, developing countries and uh, once you have uh, reported uh, once you have reconstructed the catch in, a, in other words added everything uh, it turns out that uh, the 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 world catch is declining quite rapidly and why is it declining and why is it not noted in a not so strong in a field catch because there is a tendency when the catch reporting improves uh uh to not re, re, to not uh, improve the catch retroactively so if a country that did not report all its catch improves its statistics it it reports a higher catch in in the present and later but uh, the earlier catches are not corrected so basically you have the 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 appearance of a catch increase or catch stabilization e even when the catch decreases and uh, this paper is now quite well uh, assimilated by the community Everybody now agrees that the world catch is higher than uh, than indicated by the official statistics. Now, in the catch is taken at different trophic level. Uh, the most fish like tuna and and uh, cod and and uh, groupers, most big fish that we like are. At trophic level 3.5 to 4.5, and um, this fish uh, feeds on sardine and other smaller fish that uh, are, have trophic level of uh, 
of 2.5 to 3.5, about. Um, and uh, these prey fish have been feeding on zooplankton um, that has a trophic level of two because they are herbivores and feed on phytoplankton. So basically when you catch a tuna, you at trophic level four, you one ton of tuna, you, you have uh, embodied in this ton of tuna, you have uh, 10 tons of prey fish, 100 tons of zooplankton and 1000 tons of phytoplankton because the conversion efficiency is about 10% per year, per, per trophic level. So if we know the catch of all species, which we do uh, from the sea around us database and uh, FAO database, and we know the, the trophic level of, of all species, which we do from fish base, uh, then we can express the catch uh, as primary production relative to the local primary production. And uh, the, the results are maps. And uh, here you get uh, the catch in the 50s uh, expressed in, in terms of the percentage of the local primary production. The scale doesn't matter. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, while there was, there was everywhere uh, uh, local fisheries uh, on on coastlines, uh, a concentration of catches was really occurring uh, only uh, in the North Atlantic and in East Asia around Japan. Why is it so? Because these are the first countries that are that have, that have applied uh, industrial fishing uh, on a grand scale. So around uh, the Iberian Peninsula, Italy, and so on, you can see that. That is a, a, a function of industrialization. Now you can you 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 can see in the sixties, seventies, eighties, oops, eighties, nineties, two thousand, two thousand, two thousand. Oops. So that's where we end up, and uh, we we have. <coughs> the expansion that I mentioned before, the expansion of humans into the world, into the different continents, and the annihilation of the big animals. I didn't, I didn't show that just uh, because I have an interest in ancient history. Be uh, I have shown that because this is part of the pattern that repeated, that repeats itself in, in, the, in the conquest of the ocean. In other words, we have on land done thousands of, years, thousands of years ago exactly the same thing that we are now doing in the ocean because we can, because we couldn't before industrialization. And, and you can see that uh, the, the, the places where there is no, no red, red or, or yellow uh, is because they are largely inaccessible uh, or because very, uh, the ocean are very unproductive. That is uh, the the uh, for the that is true for the southern o ocean. That is uh, not very productive. Uh, but what you have is we will now develop uh, cradle fisheries that will make this uh, uh, also red and and orange, and so that uh, the, the conquest will be finished. It will be also the end of the mammals and and birds such as penguins in uh, in Antarctica. So basically, I'm coming to the end. Basically, this pattern uh, of fishing, of uh, of uh, of uh, expansion, uh, is really a pattern of of fishing down where you, you concentrate first, if you can catch them, on a big animal because they are more valuable. Uh, and then you, you go down the food web and uh, it occurs at all level of ecosystem. And, and it is sometimes masked, masked by expansion because every time you, you expand the fishery, uh, you, you catch again, big one. Big, big fish that you had no access before. So 
if you don't standardize uh, for the area where you operate, you have the impression that uh, fishing down does not occur. But actually, if you, uh, if you standardize for the area that you operate, you will, you will see that uh, fishing down occurs everywhere. Now, this is, these pictures are from China fisheries. And this is not to criticize China or Chinese. This is to show what happens if you don't do anything about fishing down. This is at the end of the arrow, at the tip of the arrow, small fish, juvenile fish, small invertebrates, uh, jellyfish uh, in a mixture that uh, is uh, not edible and that is used uh, largely for feeding, um, for feeding uh, aquaculture farms. Uh, this is not edible, people don't eat that. This is used for farming. And because there is a market for this kind of stuff, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, fisheries authority think that their fishery is, well, not so bad, but actually it, they lose a huge amount of money because if this fish could grow, they would make much more money and much more um, uh, save energy and so on. So uh, I, I'm, I work very, very uh, systematically with Chinese colleagues uh, showing what, what, what the implication of this, of, this, of this fishery is. So in summary, and that perhaps we can talk about, it is, I have, uh, do not subsidize the industrial fishery sector. If if we cannot uh, if we cannot uh, money on its make money on its own, it is likely that the stock it relies are overexploited. Now I I could have presented uh, a whole series of slides on subsidization. Subsidies are a, a big problem in fisheries and especially in European and Asian fisheries. Why? Because basically they maintain fleet that have overfished the the system on which they rely, on the ecosystem on which they rely. And uh, normally, uh, I, when I was a student, I, was, uh, I learned in fishery science that uh, uh, there is an automatic uh, uh, reg self-regulation that uh, if you overfish, you, you catch less money, though, therefore you, you will uh, stop overfishing. This is not so, because if you overfish and you don't make money, you turn around and you say you whine uh, with the government or the European Commission and you get money and you can continue to do that. And uh, therefore uh, subsidies have become the problem. And at the WTO, uh, the World Trade Organization in Geneva, there is a huge, uh, there is a continued uh, discussion about getting rid of subsidies. And it could be that this, it will work this time because even for market uh, market uh, free market fanatics uh, uh, subsidization of fisheries is really a bad news it's not only it's not only for the conservation community the the other point is in fisheries is that management by quota in which you 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 established how much fish can be caught is is a good thing but uh, this quota has to be low enough for the stocks to be rebuilt. And basically in countries like, uh, like uh, Portugal and Spain and France and in Europe in general, uh, the answer to, to declining catches and declining biomass was simply to fish elsewhere. So expansion, the, what, what I've shown you. And, and the, since we cannot expand much more, uh, what will have to be done is rebuild the stocks that were traditionally exploited. And I think that rebuilding will be, will all emphasis now will be on rebuilding also in Europe. And the fight for rebuilding is actually what is, uh, what is uh, the, the main, the main issue now in Europe, because they are 
there are powerful forces that are very content to continue overexploiting uh, overfished stocks, declining stocks that are that are much lower than they should be, as long as they get subsidized. And the answer to this is to rebuild the stocks such that uh, they the, they can be exploited without subsidies. Now, my last point is there are. It is also necessary to set up marine reserves and the the marine reserve or MPA have been uh, to up to now uh, either that have been created are largely paper parks in other words you you declare a marine reserve and then you don't care and then and then and then people continue to fish in it or or you declare uh, a marine reserve in a in a, in a territory that belongs to 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 you, like in France, uh, in New Caledonia, or in in Kermadec Island, in a, uh, sorry, in Kerguelen Island, in the middle of nowhere in the South Pacific, so that you don't have to do it in in your in in your metropolitan country, and that is a, a big problem because Europe has essentially no marine protected area uh, that are really really protected. And so the marine uh, biodiversity is really in trouble. So I will stop here. The rest uh, is uh, uh, present uh, the the people who work uh, with me, uh, uh, mainly, uh, yeah, uh, people from different countries. I, I, the group that I have is is very international and. Uh, uh, many of them have been PhD students, and uh, and uh, we have uh, altogether. I have had about 100 people working for me in in the, in the course of 20 years, and uh, uh, the the reconstruction work has included uh, uh, 300 more people, including, for example, in Portugal, and uh, it has been very good and. Uh, we continue to work on uh, together on various things, so that's uh, that's what I wanted to present, and um, uh, we cannot talk about questions and so on. So I'm we done. Can. Thank you very we much. Can. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think you can uh, you can stop sharing the screen now so that we make sure we have a fast uh, connection or I can do it if you want me to. No sharing of uh, yeah, I would. Yeah, great. Can you? Yeah. Un oh, okay. I, I just did it. <laughs> that's that's great. Okay. So, Thank you so much for your very clear presentation. Um, actually, it was very interesting because we have also um, uh, talked about other issues uh, such as subsidies quite a lot by now. And uh, we had last month, we had uh, Carlos Duarte, the, um, I'm sure you know him, he wrote the, the Rebuilding Marine Life paper and you were, you, you were precisely talking about that right here in the end of your presentation. So I think it was a great overview and i think we should jump right into um to our questions we have quite a lot already so let's try to answer them all i think you can see them also no um, it's on the q a icon but either way i'm going to read them so okay, here so we that, go yes yeah, so that we make sure that all of the participants can listen to what was asked and then uh, the answer so from anna down we have a, um, a, a technique a more technical question which is in the graph showing uh, that the fleets are fishing deeper what do the different uh, the different lines and dots represent okay it was the, in your presentation yeah yeah the the plot of um, fi uh, fishing deeper the different line uh, present uh, different years uh, so you you have uh, uh, different years uh, of the average depth at which they operate uh, if I, if I think right, I think that's what it was. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then uh, from Nun Salz Enrique, she's asking: Besides the reported catch data, what are the other sources of information used to rec reconstruct the real catches? Some examples. Could you? So, please? so first of all, there is a reported catch to FAO, and there is uh, the the catch that uh, the agency, for example, the 
Fisheries Department of Portugal has on its website. And, and strangely enough, it's not the same. Uh, uh, the, 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 the catches that uh, are reported to FAO are a subset of the data that Portugal has and every country has. And uh, some of the, uh, of some of the country, I don't know specifically for Portugal, uh, but uh, you can see that they don't send everything they have. That's number one. So the first thing is to, is to obtain what uh, the country really has, as opposed to what it submitted. The second thing is to assemble, re assemble the, the part that, uh, that the country doesn't report, but also has. Uh, for example, in the UK, uh, every boat under 10 meters uh, uh, has a catch that is not reported. Uh, uh, the artisanal catch, uh, small scale catch, is simply does not exist uh, in in the fishery statistics of the UK. Now that doesn't mean they don't know about it, but they don't report it. There are categories of catches that are never reported. Uh, uh, only one country in the world, uh, Finland, or reports the, the, the recreational catch. Uh, so they, they have, uh, in various countries, they have every five years or so, uh, uh, an evaluation of how much catch is made, how much, how much is being caught by recreational fisher. And, but uh, it's, it's, this is not integrated in the statistics. It's, it's completely separate. And in the U.S., in South Africa, where there is, uh, there are enormous uh, recreational fisheries, the the catch is not, is simply not used. Another example is uh, is countries that reported report only the catch that they export, because they are the, these are commodities that uh, bring foreign exchange. And the catch that is consumed locally is simply not reported as caught. And, and, but it is available, or you can reconstruct it from consumption data, food from seafood consumption data. And, and that, involved, that may involve, for example, get an uh, estimation of the size of the tourist sector, uh, how many uh, people come into this island country uh, as tourists, and uh, how much do they eat that is provided by, uh, by uh, artisanal fisher that sell directly to the hotels. All of this can be <laughs> reconstructed. Uh, uh, recreational catch in West Africa. There is lots of fishing going on in so-called safari, uh, safari resort in West Africa. It's, a, it's funny because safari is a, is a Swahili word that is from West, from East Africa. Anyway. The people get angling, but uh, this uh, the countries don't report any 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 recreational fishery. And then people think there is no recreational fishing in West Africa. There is, and the resort, the resort, the safari resort, the fishing safari resort, have data on on a Facebook page and so on. So you can actually reconstruct. It's lots of work. It's it's uh, that's the reason why. There were lots of people involved in uh, reconstruction work, but uh, you can reconstruct the catch of fisheries that exist because fisheries are never isolated. Uh, they are social activities. And so you can always see a, a social shadow that they throw on, uh, on, on society as a whole. So that's the answer. Yeah. Then, uh, Thank yeah. you. Uh, I'll, I'll ask the, the next question from Gonzalo Arujo, actually a, a colleague of ours here in Portugal. Hi, Gonzalo. Uh, his, hi, Gonzalo. <laughs> his, his question is about uh, fishing subsidies. So he says, uh, regarding fishery subsidies and knowing the lack of available economic indicators, at least in the Portuguese case, what measures do you see as the fastest way to end them? Well, I mentioned that subsidies are not only criticized by the conservation community, that is, politically the left, if you like, but also by the right, because they, they, the, the people who believe in free market and capitalism and stuff, uh, they, not, they don't like subsidies because they, they distort 
the market uh, uh, situation. So there is, I, the, I believe that the best way to, to get rid of subsidies is to, is to get an alliance of countries that are against subsidies and they are in fisheries. Uh, such countries exist that don't give much subsidies to the fisheries. Uh, the US, uh, the Australia, New Zealand, and so on. And uh, I have been a part of an initiative that almost succeeded uh, about eight years ago uh, at the WTO. And my friend Rashid Sumaila, who works a lot on, on subsidies, he, he works with, uh, with the WTO in Geneva. Um, and there's a good chance that it will succeed. And because the, the, the European Commission, obviously it will not get rid of subsidies, but if the WTO pushes for abolishing subsidies, it's possible that uh, the European Union accepts it. And uh, the WTO is one of the few uh, international organization that uh, can force countries to do things. So uh, I, I think the, the best case to get rid of subsidies, the best, the best is, is now to encourage uh, the Portuguese delegation, well, no, is to, is to hope that uh, the, the, uh, the discussion in, w, in WTO uh, end, ends up with the uh, subsidies uh, that we get rid of them. And uh, yeah. I am very happy to hear that because, and, and I'm sure my colleagues from NGOs that are attending this webinar are also very happy because that's precisely the, the, the work we are having. And we are also, um, we have also hopes, I hope so on the WTO negoci negotiation yeah. um, process. And we also think, we were precisely discussing that um, the other day, we, um, that probably if the WTO gets it done in the, in the next meeting, um, the European Union will be more likely to accept this also. So, um, yes, yes uh, the European Union, Union. Union uh, cannot do that on its own. Yeah, uh, it is actually forbidden uh, to to declare uh, abolition, to be declare, uh, to change the market condition by individual countries. They have to do that collectively. And it is possible because of this alliance between uh, if you like the right and the, the left, mm -hmm. that uh, usually these things don't happen, uh, this alliance, but in the case of subsidy, it does. Yes, yes. Um, we have another question, and this one is coming from the Indonesia. Um, by the way, we have people from all across the world. I'm very happy about that also. And this is from Duranta. I hope I'm saying the name right. I am from Research Institute for Marine Fisheries of Indonesia. I would like to ask Dr. Poldi, do you have the standard procedure for doing catch reconst reconst reconstruction? <laughs> Maybe we can use it in Indonesia. It is related to the question above. So we had a, the catch reconstruction uh, for Indonesia was very difficult because because the country is big first of all and it is uh, and it is um, we, first of all we we split uh, the the indonesian catch uh, the indonesian uh, region in two in two areas the uh, three areas uh, uh, the indian ocean coast from sumatra all the way to lombok uh, the Indian Ocean coast, then the central part, which is the the Java Sea and uh, the southern South China Sea, and the eastern part, which is the Moluca, essentially. And uh, you can, uh, on our website, uh, uh, you can see uh, the how we treated each of them. The next problem is that the Indonesian statistics do not differentiate between small and large scale. Uh, Sometimes FAO doesn't either, but sometimes the countries uh, differentiate between that. that. And we, we separated, uh, I worked with two Indonesian colleagues uh, because I, I worked in Indonesia two years, so I know, I know a little bit the country. Uh, uh, we separated uh, the Indonesian 
the industrial uh, fisheries from the from the from the artisanal fisheries uh, using the the catch composition because certain fish are caught only by one type of gear and the other and uh, it was the the catch reconstruction for indonesia was difficult and the 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 problem is that in the in the, in the 80s and in the 80s 90 there was a, there was a clear uh, uh, manipulation of data the 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 catch uh, is increasing was increasing exponentially and uh, the catch composition was not changing so you had if you take logarithm you had uh, a number of straight line uh, which uh, which increased by about 1.5 to 2 percent per year and this was a clear indication that uh, that the catch were manufactured that they were not real um, so there was a period about 20 30 years uh, of about 20 to 30 years in from the 70s to to the 90s um, where uh, the catch uh, of Indonesia were were not real, and that that poses a, a big problem. Well, how do you how do you what what do you add to it? Given that you don't even know that uh, that uh, the 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 base uh, that is reported is is not real, you can I in each country depending on the nature of the of the country and the fishery and uh, the reported data uh, the the catch reconstruction is different that's why we have in each country uh, a, a document uh, 10 20 pages that uh, describe how the reconstruction was done and uh, the the reconstruction was uh, done in in great detail in um, in uh, in Indonesia, and uh, there is a paper by myself and, and uh, uh, an Indonesian colleague called uh, Budi Martono, uh, Vanya, uh, young woman. Uh, we have tried to to do the best we could, but we're not very happy with the Indonesian um, reconstruction because um, the the core of the of the data is uh, was manufactured by uh, is not real. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's a good segue into our next question. Um, it it doesn't come with a name. We we just have the question, and it's related to uh, actually that to the catch reconstruction and standardization. So the question is, how do you overcome data standardization and provenance challenges when using lots of different data sources from different countries? Yeah, so they are number a number of things first of all if you if you combine um, a number of countries each of which has been reconstructed the best you can but each of them by a, a different team working independently of the other team as was the case then uh, if you have 200 countries um, you don't have a systematic error that is too high or too low. They, some of them will be too high and some of them will be too low. And uh, they will actually compensate in part for each other if they have been independent. And we have made each reconstruction independent of the other. In other words, there is no guideline. The guideline was only, uh, there should be an industrial sector there should be an artisanal sector, there should be a subsistence sector and recreational sector. And it should go from 1950 to 2010, later, uh, later years. And there should be a value for every year. And a value of zero is not acceptable for an estimate of zero for, for uh, a fishery that exists. You cannot put NA, not available. You, you have to put something and you have to document in this uh, documentation that we have for each country, you have to document what you have done. And uh, in this were the rules and uh, 
And this way, you end up with a reconstruction that are very reliable and some that are not very reliable. And uh, we have a scoring system that we had developed later, uh, a scoring system that uh, resembles the scoring system you, you see in airports. Was it uh, good, very, uh, was it uh, very bad, bad, good, very good? There is no middle. And uh, you, you uh, they don't say, they don't say what good is. They don't say what bad is. They, it, you put your impression. And we have a system like that where each person who does a reconstruction for a period of 20 years uh, or less uh, says, what the data, the, the quality of the data as assessed by the person who does reconstruction. So we have for each, each uh, reconstruction, for each sector and each period of time, uh, an evaluation of the, the quality of the data, the quality of the reconstruction really. And, and this allows us, when we put the stuff together, to get uh, an idea of the quality of the of the of the overall data set and uh, uh, the graph that I showed uh, showed the the the, the error uh, band around this this is very narrow it is very narrow because uh, when you add up uh, lots of things that have uh, errors say of 20 percent uh, they reduce to 10 percent by by the fact that you have uh, so many uh, that uh, are not, if you don't assume that they are, um, that they are all biased upward or biased downward. And so uh, we have, uh, we now give uh, for each of our catch report, catch data set, we give, we give a score. Uh, and uh, this score, you can see it on our website for the stock assessment, because the stock assessment for uh, individual species rely on the catch that we assemble uh, uh, of that species for every country. And we will, uh, in in a two months, uh, or perhaps one month, uh, we will have this uh, band of uh, catch uh, quality uh, under each of the country uh, under each of the country uh, um, time series data. And uh, this is bizarre because we, we are being criticized by FAO, we have been, for, for modifying the data. And, uh, and we are saying, we can now say, uh, we have a confidence band around the data and they still don't because uh, the perception is that FAO data are real. Uh, they are not estimates, but uh, they are obviously estimate as well. And they also should have confidence intervals. So, so the, we, have, we have encountered uh, so much resistance for at, the, at the beginning uh, against the reconstructed data that we had to find a way to accommodate uh, this uh, uncertainty. And we have done it by this scheme that I mentioned with, with the, uh, scoring the, the data. Uh, it originated from, um, from the IPCC that also has to evaluate different data sets that they put together into a, a common, a common um, report. And, uh, so, so there we are. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we, we, we will be looking forward for that. Um... Uh, you actually, anybody who is interested in uh, the, the papers that document these details, I am quite willing to send them. Uh, you know my, my address, yeah. my email address, and you just say, I, I would like to have a paper on that and I send it uh, right away.
Great, great. I, I will make sure I write that on the email we are going to send following up the, the issue. Um, so stepping into another uh, issue, uh, we have a question from Rosario Dominguez and she's asking what would be the objective of stock biomass rebuilding? What does happen in those areas or ecosystems oh, yeah. where regime shifts have taken place? Ba basically, the more fish you have in the water, uh, ecologically, they, the, the, the different fish that we had in the water, uh, each of them had a, a role to play. The, the sardine were feeding the, the seals and, uh, and the tuna, and uh, the tuna were doing their thing, uh, and uh, each of the, of the, the species were, was assuming a role. And basically the biomass of all species has been reduced to an extent that they they don't function ecologically in in what was their role and rebuilding allows this role to be played the second thing about rebuilding the biomass if the biomass is higher uh the catch per effort of fisheries will be higher and the catch per effort translate directly into income so basically you you get ecosystem that that resemble what they were before if you rebuild the stocks and you get uh, the fishery is getting far more money and basically we can we can risk uh, talking about let's rebuild them to msy level to the level that uh, generate maximum sustainable yield because there are people who say, well, you cannot rebuild all stock to maximum sustainable yield because they interact in a way that if you have lots of cod and then they will eat, uh, uh, they will eat uh, the little sardine and so on. But basically, at present, the biomass of all fish in all European ecosystem, for example, is, are, are reduced to, to an extent such that we don't have to think much about how, how to optimize the system. It, it, all species should have a break. And if they, ha if they had a break, all fishers would benefit from this because uh, the, the biomass being higher would, would be, would be generated, generating a higher catch per effort, which translate into income right away. Moreover, an ecosystem that has most, more biomass is also more resilient. Why? Each of the of the species is represented by more individuals, and the more individuals you have, the more variance you have in their properties. They they, for example, uh, if you have three fish, they the variability in the response to temperature will be less than the variability that you have if you have three hundred fish, and and so a system that uh, has more individuals will have also more individuals that have properties or, or traits that can resist, for example, global warming. So basically, challenges that uh, are that or, or, or crisis that happened uh, to ecosystem or challenges to ecosystem can be withstood better if you have more animals in there that can respond if you have just a few uh, lone uh, representative of each species the species can be gone in in an instant so basically everybody wins if you can rebuild uh, and rebuilding is a matter of having quota that are low enough not they don't need to be zero uh, that are low enough that the population can can still grow. Good. Uh, yeah, the next question is is going to be a nice segue into this because it's another way of trying to to rebuild biomass. Uh, it's a question from Anna Marsalu. Uh, she's a she's a researcher here in the Algarve who studies interactions between uh, cetaceans and fisheries, among other things. Uh, and her question is about um, well, how how to one of the ways that we could maybe rebuild biomass. So the the question is.
uh, to reduce overfishing and considering the EU uh, common fisheries policy discard ban, how can we make it effective if member states, mostly the southern countries like Portugal or Spain, are not prepared to accommodate inland the excess capture fish in certain fisheries? So are discard bans really a solution or should we move uh, to other conservation and more effective solutions like MPAs and fishing effort reduction of fleets? Well, <clears throat> I don't think that the discard ban is meant to replace anything. It's not meant to replace MPA or reduction of effort. Uh, the one thing that doesn't happen in reality in the real world is that one solution solves everything. Uh, that is clearly not the case. Discard bands have are tempting uh, because because discarding fish is is really is really immoral let's call it like this. This is, you throw away good food. But um, the ban is likely to push fishers into using the fish. In other words, fish that were discarded before will be used if this is taken seriously. And if they if they if there is if this fish is used this will gradually generate a demand for them and then people will be targeting this fish and basically this is a dangerous development because then you you have even more reason to fish everything on the other hand the discard ban is supposed to to motivate people to look at at selective fishing and selective fishing would prevent discarding also i think that that it is not that the discard ban is is a is a fix for a big problem that we have which is the use of trawlers the use of trawlers because the the real problem is the use of trawlers because trawlers cannot fish selectively and and if we do a discard ban we 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 address the big issue the big immoral issue of these trawlers throwing so much fish around throwing uh, so much fish away but the problem remains that 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 trawlers fish non-selectively and what we should look at is getting rid of trawlers and now now on the long term but there are quite a few countries that have no trawling zone and that i think is is what we should look for uh i the 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 no discard ban with the continuation of trawling is a receipt for disaster because because you 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 will have a situation where you will create a market for the fish that is thrown overboard and then it will generate uh, additional demand uh, the best thing is to get rid of trawling and and it's it's actually not crazy because trawling destroys uh, the bottom and it destroyed a uh, bottom community uh it uh it uh, contributes to uh to uh um to to pollution uh, no no uh, trophication uh, trophication uh because uh, it remila it uh, resuspends uh, sediment and uh, the best way and 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 it is it is a method of fishing that would never be authorized if it if it had not been invented about 500 years ago so i think trawling getting rid of it is is actually a good thing and besides it uses an enormous quantity of energy uh and uh uh yeah getting rid of trawling is actually the thing that we should aim at rather than uh then then uh, 
than banning these cards. Banning with these cards. Yeah. Uh, very interesting that you said that um, even though it's an opinion that's shared for uh, some uh, some of the NGOs we work with, it's 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 it's, it's nice to hear you uh, say that. Uh, regarding that um, about the paper paper parks you talked during your presentation, we have someone from the Spanish Institute of Oce Oceanography, and he would like to know. What do you think about paper reserves? If you see there is any advantages about creating MPAs without a budget for surveillance, I guess yeah. this one is quite easy. <laughs> it, it it is. I there is a paper that was published in Science in a, a few months ago that showed that in a, in an around the North Sea area, the marine reserves and marine MPA are actually killing zones. They, they have more fishing effort than other area. Uh, that it is, it is a situation where governments accept to do things that don't work, uh, accept to, to, to make law laws that are meant not to be respected and now that is that is a bad development uh, in in a democracy uh, if you if if the if the if the law if legislation is not respected because actually the lawmaker uh, doesn't mean it because the this this thing can have a ramification. You you can have if you have a parliament that makes laws that are meant not to be respected. Uh, there are other things that are not going to work, and and uh, the trouble that we are in in the U.S., for example, with people demonstrating nonstop in other countries, is a is about that kind of things where you have laws, but you accept that they don't get respected right you had law protecting people and the police doesn't respect them and and at this to to have ministers then proclaim that uh, they do something for the environment and they don't manifestly they don't what it creates is that you don't trust the government and that is really <laughs> really bad it, it it's really because it it corrupts everything it uh it it can start there is uh, fairly innocent an mpa you fish in an mpa and then you you don't respect the the, the speed limits and you, then you beat your wife it doesn't matter because they don't do anything about it and then you beat uh, an immigrant because it doesn't matter what and so on the, the, the non-respect of the law, if you build it in, is is a bad thing because we are governments that our governments are supposed to be democratic, and governments of laws and uh, and 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 so so this is a bigger problem. This is a a big issue. This is not only an environmental issue. This is a, a question of how. How do you organize justice? How you how you get a citizen involved in in running the country? And and if you deliberately build structures that are constructed on lies, uh, that is not healthy for your democracy. So so it's not a fisheries problem. It's not this is not a fisheries problem any more than uh, than uh, than. Uh, aggression against people is a medical problem you know what i mean it it's not uh, it it has medical consequences but it's not a medical problem it's not uh, it's not it's not for the environmental community as such to 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 insist on on the law being respected yeah a very good point and coming back to the mpas i mean that's that's one of the of the biggest arguments by people who want sometimes to prevent the, the issuing of new marine protected areas is that we have several who are not correctly correctly monitored or policed. So what's the point on creating more if the ones we have now 
don't really function as they should, which is a valid point and, and one that yeah. we must be aware of. If we have all these uh, goals of 30% uh, of MPAs by 2030, but it's true that if we don't pay attention to the, to the policy side and the monitoring side, then obviously it's bound to fail. So uh, yeah. keeping on this issue, the next question um, is, uh, what do you think of designating, designating a higher number of relatively small MPAs, including partially protected areas, as a complement or even as opposed to claiming very large non-use MPAs? Uh, I must say, uh, I prefer non-use MPA, uh, no-take MPA, mm -hmm. but uh, the no-take MPA that it, that have been created, have been created only in areas where there's almost no people uh, for obvious reason. So uh, even small MPA in areas where there is lots of fishing can, can make a difference, even small, small ones, but part fish, uh, partly, partly exploited or partly, ex yeah, partly exploited MPA, uh, essentially don't work because what you want to protect is the, the 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 fish that are sensitive and the fish that are sensitive will always be caught even if you fish only a little bit my my best example is a sawfish right uh, they have this long nose with the now you if you have one one net in a big mpa that's where the sawfish is going to be caught. Uh, they are made to be caught because of this nose. So if you want to have sawfish in a place and that they stand for other vulnerable fish, you must have no fishing, not a little bit of fishing. Imagine you have a, a forest in, in a mountain in Portugal and you would allow people going with uh, chainsaws only on every second Sunday. And only if, only if your name start with a P. And only, it doesn't matter. It would be, you would have no forest. Basically, the, the notion of no fishing has, has to get in. That a little bit of fishing is like a little bit of pregnancy. It's impossible. You 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 fish or you don't fish. You, you don't. <laughs> not partly pregnant. Yeah. Thank you for that analogy. Very interesting. Um, we are we are trying to uh, to group these questions into several issues because we had a lot of questions regarding several uh, themes. And ne the next one is from Dimitri, and it's about seafood consumption. Uh, if we are talking about the future of fisheries, uh, asks Dimitri, should we only think about in terms of production and related problems? Shouldn't we also focus on the consumption side of the issue? If demand for fish and seafood of a certain kind is high, aren't the resulting high prices a strong motive for continue uh, to overfish or to intensively fish? Um, I, I believe that is, uh, there is no direct connection between uh, uh, the seafood consumption in a country and the fishing in that country because we have now international markets and international uh, movement of fish. In fact, fish are with coffee, together with coffee, the most traded commun commodity in the world. Okay. Uh, if you compared it with rice, for example, rice is consumed, most rice is consumed within 50 kilometers of where it is grown. The, so rice doesn't travel. Fish travel a lot, more than, <laughs> more once they're dead than, than, than they traveled before. And so you can, you can run a very successful campaign of, let's eat no fish in, in Portugal. You are 100% successful. Portuguese is no fish. Do you think it's going to reduce the fishing effort? No, it's not, because they can export to China. And, and imagine an infinite demand. Uh, that, is, that is China. Uh, and 
so the this decoupling of the of the of the market the consuming market and the production is actually the reason why there is so many problems imagine in earlier times when there was no ice uh no rapid transport and stuff a little village in portugal in the north they fished a, a big pile of sardine what are they going to do with it they what they're going to do with it uh the price immediately goes down because because the village cannot absorb all this sardine so there is an automatic um, balance uh and people will not go out to fish more sardine because they lose their shirt but imagine now there is a, a market that use enormous quantity of sardine to grind them up to make fish meal to produce uh, salmon that they there is uh, you can in this village you can go and fish the sardine to death and you bypass the local consumer and uh, your trucks go right away to norway and that is the reason why 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 every village in the world for example has uh, a chinese trader buying shark fins and they overfished the 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 the, the shark fins that they wouldn't the, the sharks that they would not uh, touch otherwise because there is no no market this is why in a, in a, in a, in a, in islands of the pacific where before the the local chiefs could prevent the young men from overfishing the, the fisher from overfishing the local reefs now they will come with a with a boat with a johnson engine whoops take all the to all the fish uh, bring them to the local to the village to the city uh in a refrigerated plane put it shows up in paris or in lisbon uh a few a few hours later as beautiful fish that you can i'm sure in lisbon you can get fish from uh asia uh caught in the pacific and stuff i've seen that in in the market in paris uh where where there was no cod because the cod is from europe and they, they are gone but there was fish there were species of fish from the indian ocean and groupers and you know meru uh they they were all kind of fish that had been had been fished by small scale fishers uh quickly frozen uh, and uh, put on airplanes and and they show up then in paris and this this uncoupling of the market uh of the market from the production uh make me very much doubt that we can regulate uh, fisheries via consumption uh yeah yeah a very interesting point uh and yeah uh, continuing on this on this topic of of consumption uh we have a small question um which is what is your opinion about eco, eco label for fishery products like msc friend of the sea etc um i i i was uh, very much in favor of the msc and i was heavily involved in it uh be, even before it was founded uh in the in the launching of it and i was in london in parliament and stuff a uh, big deal and then like many people i i i suffered when they when they certified one horrible fishery after the other and uh then i gradually distanced myself from them and i don't want to hear about them anymore i think they are they are now become an aspect of the of the of the business community the they are the pr of the of the business community they are not anymore a bridge between the conservation community and the the business community which they were supposed to be uh they were created by unilever and uh and uh, wwf and as a as a bridge um they were supposed to connect the two communities and they have now become completely um 
a, a PR arm of the business community, and basically they enjoy they enjoy a, a price um, increase for promising something that that is not true, that is sustainability. But if I can just uh, on a personal note ask a, a follow up question on this, do you think that any certification scheme is bound to become kind of like prone prone yeah. to that kind of situation mm -hmm. or do you think that it can really uh, effectively have a long-term um, contract with conservation this this problem uh, is called industry capture and it is it is the capture of of the of the of the of the industry or by the industry that is supposed to be looked at that is supposed to be watched that is supposed to be controlled of uh, the capture of this agency by the industry and uh, that is very common and it goes back it goes back to to plato's republic uh, because this is a problem of uh, you, you have a society you have guardians of society but who watch the guardians and uh, in all countries, you, you see that ruling uh, for the ruler, for the emperor, uh, how do you rule with people that have their own interest at, that might not serve you? And uh, uh, you can have the church because the bishop are not supposed to have children, or you can have eunuchs, uh, people who cannot have children because um, they have cut something. Uh, you can have all kind of tricks that governments uh, in, a, in the course of history, emperors have developed. And, and industry capture is a modern form of that. Uh, if you have, you have a democratically elected government that creates an agency or a ministry that is supposed to control an industry, oil industry or mining industry, and the people who are in it, they are influenced by the people that they are supposed to control. And they gradually adopt the ideas. They, they need not be corrupt. Uh, they gradually adopt the ideas of the people that they are supposed to, to, uh, to control. So basically, industry capture is unavoidable. What is, that's what I'm saying. And it is, in the case of the MSC, uh, the industry capture is, uh, was facilitated by the fact that the incentive structure of the MSC is erroneous because they, they, they live off they, the, the money that they get depends on certified. Uh, it doesn't depend on, on, it is not neutral vis-a-vis -vis certification. So if the MSC uh, were not to certify anything because everything is lousy, the, it would have no income. And that is, uh, can you imagine if a judge, um, if the salary of a judge, depending on how many people go to jail, uh, they, would be, they would get to jail for crossing the road, uh, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Um, so continuing, uh, um, first, uh, we are heading to the end of our discussion. I would like to ask you if you have, if you can have 10 more minutes uh, so that, because we had a, um, a, a really high number of questions and we tried to manage them all. Uh, could you stay in for another 10 minutes? Um, sure, okay. Yeah? Sure. Okay. Uh, so I, the I next, yeah. I see one question here. In yeah. China, there's so much bycatch. Is it because of the area they fish, or is it the result of the gear itself? Or are they low for minimum mesh size? This is, uh, I, I have uh, a Chinese student who came to do a PhD, and we, did, uh, we wrote a paper about that. Actually, they have a, a mesh size limit uh, for trawlers uh, of two centimeters in China, two centimeters. But uh, the, like everywhere else in the world, the, 
fishing, the fishers cheat and they use mesh sizes of about like this. So if you use very small mesh size, the big trawlers, you are gonna catch lots of little things. And in fact, the big thing will disappear, big fish will disappear and will go extinct, uh, locally extinct. And the only thing that you're gonna have in the catch are big, small things. So, so you have this uh, uh, vicious circle that if, you, if the mesh size you use is small, uh, all you're gonna get is small things. And uh, so they don't respect the law that they have in China. And uh, they have an excess, uh, a huge excess of, uh, of boats uh, that the Chinese government doesn't know how to handle. Because contrary to, to what people believe, China, uh, if, the, if the president says, let's do this, well, <laughs> you cannot, it, it's, it, it doesn't happen. If the Chinese government says, let's not overfish, well, yes, they have, uh, they have millions of fishes and, and they won't do it. Um, basically, they would have to, to break, to, to, have to, to send in the army, and then that they would have trouble. So China has exactly the same problem as other more democratic countries have which is the fishers do what they please and, uh, and uh, it is difficult to force them to do otherwise. Uh, so they can do something about all this business by, by not subsidizing. And that's the reason why China is also involved in the discussion of the WTO because, because right now they use subsidies the withdrawing of subsidies only for, for gross illegal fishing for, for, as a punishment. But uh, uh, they will have to use it as a policy instrument. And uh, they are learning about this, like everybody else is. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting. Uh, next question is uh, from Jesus Falcon uh, from the um, Spanish Institute of Oceanography. So his question, his question is, uh, obviously we all agree that overfishing is the main cause of decreased catches or decreased stocks, let's say. But what do you think about the role of global warming in uh, fisheries in recent decades? Is it possible to measure what percentage belongs to each of these driving forces? So uh, when uh, I was told that I would have a lecture of, of uh, half an hour, 20, 20 minutes to half an hour. So what I what I do did I took a, a standard lecture that I have that includes the effect of fishing and global warming, and I remove all of the slides that have to do with global warming, because um, we we have worked here on global warming a lot, and basically we can show that uh, that uh, this movement toward the poles has begun in 1900 in the 70s already so so in the data in the fao data uh, as crude as they are you can detect the signal of movement toward the pole uh, and how can you detect it well a country like portugal or spain or the uk reports uh the occurrence of fish that are more um, that are coming from the south. That are so in Portugal, you're catching more fish that uh, were before in Morocco, and in the UK they catch fish that were before in Portugal, and in Spain. And uh, this we we what we did we invented a concept called the the mean temperature of the catch because each fish has a preferred temperature. Uh, that, that is very stable. It doesn't change over millennia. Uh, each fish has a, a 15 degrees, this species is 18 degrees, this species is 21 degrees, and so on. So you can compute the temperature of the catch by taking, multiplying the temperature of this fish of that, that is preferred by that fish by the quantity that is caught. And you 
add up all the products and divide by the total catch. You get the mean temperature of the catch. And you can show that in European countries, for example, the temperature of the catch increased since the 70s. It, it's like straight and it, it is almost parallel to the temperature itself. So temperature and temperature of the catch increased. It was published in Nature. We were very happy in 2010 or something, 13. Uh, and we can show that uh, everywhere. The, this is happening except in the tropics because in the tropics, you get no fish coming from the hypertropics because there is no hypertropics. So we can show that uh, that there is a replacement of species happening in all countries that are intermediate uh, temperate countries, essentially subtropical and temperate countries, have more species from low latitudes. And they cold water fish uh, leave toward the port. So this is a replacement. And uh, the countries that are in, at intermediate latitude if they can adapt to the the change of of species and that's no problem with the modern gear that can fish anything they they will be able to uh to continue having reasonable catch for several decades the problem is uh is in the poles where the local species would completely go and in the tropics in the tropics there is no species uh, replacement. There is simply a species disappearing one after the other. And that, that is, that is the, a, a real problem. And so you, you, you can see, well, actually you cannot see because in the tropics, it's also the place where you have lots of species and not many fishery scientists. So, except for Australia or the U.S., which are which have lots of scientists uh, and uh, tropical areas, uh, there is not much science, fishery research, being done in the intertropical belt. And uh, so, the documentation of of the loss that is happening, you don't know in part. All of a sudden, a species is not there. Is it because of pollution, overfishing, global warming? You don't know. And that, that is going to remain the case, that, that overfishing will continue, uh, that uh, the disappearing of fish because of global warming will continue, especially in the tropics. And people will not be able to dis uh, separate the two. Thank you. Um, we are going to our last question, which was uh, made by a colleague of ours, Gonzalo. And um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a good link uh, between what we, you were saying previously. And in, it strengthens one, once more that it, is, uh, it was a really great honor for us to have you here and to, and to get the chance to talk with you about so many of these issues. We tried to, to collect most of the questions. I am sorry if we didn't get to answer all of them. Um, can, can I share your email when I send a follow-up email to, to all of the participants? Can I send your email and then everybody can send their questions to you? Um, and so for our last uh, comment and question, question in this case, uh, how would you explain to decision maker the multiple benefits of establishing fishing limits not exceeding scientific advice? Well, uh, fisheries that are not managed uh, are destroyed, they self-destroy. It's like, uh, it is as if uh, there was a tendency towards uh, suicide. They, the fisheries have to be managed because they cannot, on their own, they cannot. Uh, so basically the conservation, you guys, uh, the conservation movement are an essential part of the continuation of fisheries. Because if, if, they, if they, the fishers have their way, which is no regulation, then they will destroy the fishery. 
So you have to argue that that maintaining stocks at high levels provides more higher catch and higher incomes and better biology, more resistance to changes. And that this is this is a, a fact that uh, the economy, the employment, the and the ecology benefits from from high biomass in the sea. And uh, low biomass in the sea is bad for the environment, bad for the ecology, bad for the environment. And it's also bad economics because it requires subsidies to maintain the fisheries. So you, any, any group, any environmental group such as yours has the facts on their side. And so you can argue with facts. Now, if, if somebody doesn't want to listen to facts, they have to construct an alternative reality like Trump is doing now about COVID. And, and this alternative reality, it hits uh, all the time against the resistance of facts. So stick to good science and because you have science on your side. Uh, because, because, because fishers really make more money when there is more fish. Uh, it, it is, they, fishers believe that there is lots of fish out there that, uh, because we, we tell them, you, you fish less, so the stock, they be, no, no, you don't know how to fish. Uh, there is lots of fish out there, let, just let me go. And if you do that, uh, the fishers know how to catch fish, but they don't know much else. Um, they don't know or they don't want to hear that their own fishing has the effect that it has. And uh, uh, so one has to get a politician, decision makers on board with reasonable argument. This is the only thing that that we can hope for. We that that reason wins. Um, if it if it doesn't and where it doesn't, we get a mess. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice to hear those words. I'm sure my colleagues from other NGOs all across Europe and all uh, tell, across the world. Tell everybody, uh, if I get emails, uh, a short email. Two short emails will get along. Uh, will get an answers. Uh, one long email <laughs> may get an answer, but it would, may come in six months. So short <laughs> emails, asking short question, and I answer, okay. or asking for papers. Okay. Okay. Very uh, good. While we are at, at it, um, would you mind if we share your presentation with all the participants? No, is, is that no okay? Problem. Okay. No problem. Okay. Perfect. So I guess we came to an end 15 minutes later. I'm sorry for the, That's okay. uh, for the delay. Um, it was very nice to hear those closing uh, remarks for, for all of us. It was, it's, it's very inspiring to hear you say that. Um, I do agree with you in case <laughs> you, you didn't <laughs> notice. <laughs> um, so uh, at last, I would like to thank all of the participants that attended our webinar. I would like to give you a huge thank you, Dr. Daniel uh, Polly, for making time to be here with us and for being so available when I, when I sent you the first email. Um, Nick, I don't know, do you want to say anything else? No, I, I, would, I would just repeat what you already said. Uh, thanks to all the participants and uh, yeah, thanks for, you, for your words, Professor Pauli. Obviously, we live in a world where increasingly facts seem to be uh, opinions and not really facts. So we, we need to try to, to keep our heads together and, and see them as the facts that they are and try to, to pass that message along, which is not always easy, but obviously yes. we try. Yes, and we do apologize for all of you that are still online and could not see their, uh, their questions answered, but we really got a lot of them and we tried to cover as many issues as we could. 
but I think it was an amazing one and a half, one and 45 minute um, uh, discussion. Thank you, thank you so very much again. Um, and that's it. Have a nice day. <laughs> Your day okay. is just starting, no? <laughs> Thanks, thank everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.